for assignment seven under assignments digital painting is just going to be an introduction to this very basic concept of how to use digital art and that's just to control all of the pixels in a raster based program like photoshop or photop directly to interface with the computer it's really helpful to have a, a tablet so we have the tablets open at the back this can be aided by technology even further there are cintiqs there are surfaces there are uh, certain devices where you can draw right on the, the screen and manipulate it in real time just like you were working on a real painting but at the end of the day it's just controlling the pixels and making them yourself from scratch so i'm going to go through these really quickly these are just linked under assignments and remember that digital painting is different than digital coloring, though they have a lot of similarity. Digital coloring always happens behind line work. And digital painting does not happen behind line art. It happens on top of a sketch. And sometimes there's not even a sketch. Sometimes it's just working from shape. So for an example, here are some different approaches. One type of digital painting is just what I call shape painting, and it's where you tend to use fairly large brushes with fairly opaque paints. This would be the same painting with acrylic, right? But you do it digitally, and you just rough in rough shapes, and then as you refine it, you go to smaller and smaller brushes, maybe lesser and lesser opacity, so you can soften edges, and you can really control it so that by the end, it's like every surface, every edge, every detail, every highlight, every shadow is really controlled by your own brush strokes. But notice there was no line art at any time. There wasn't even any sketching with lines. It's all shape based. Another technique that's really common, and I've demoed both in past semesters, is to just do a loose sketch, kind of a layout sketch. This is all digital, but it's made to kind of look like pencil. So you do it with a, a rough brush at like a 70% opacity. And then you can start, you know, transparent layers of paint building up texture. So this is a little bit more like how you would do a watercolor painting than an acrylic painting. And digital can be both. It just depends on how opaque your paint is. There are also different stylistic ways. So this was a, a demo I did of the author James Joyce. Uh, he died before I did the, the painting, so I didn't curse him. But... <laughs> A lot of people think of digital painting, they think of representational. They want to make it look like a photograph. And that is a definite skill to aspire to, and it's a good way to practice. But even when I'm trying to match what the photograph, what the person looks like, I don't like to match the colors, I don't like to match the texture, because the photograph already exists. So you're trying to do your own interpretation, whether you're doing a portrait or doing an animal. Realize that you can also just go different ways and you can leave things out you can leave edges you can bring in new elements and james joyce is this very experimental writer so it was fun to to kind of deconstruct him even to the point where it's not really if you just saw this image i call it non-representational it's just a collection of marks and shapes unless i titled it portrait of james joyce you wouldn't see that there's a nose and a head and and of course, you can take any of these kind of styles and inspirations and you can composite them all together. Combinations. So everyone's going to digitally paint differently. This is kind of the exact opposite of our first assignment, where you all had to steal pixels but make it look believable, and you had to arrange it and use the same techniques to clean up your edges. Digital painting is you totally design what your shapes look like, what your edges look like, how you represent things. And detail is, of course, important, but you don't want to get lost in only working on details. You also have to keep about, keep the, the idea of the whole, the whole picture in mind. So blocking your colors is just that simple way, kind of like doing flats in digital coloring, of knowing how much space certain colors should take up. And then while you're painting, you can actually steal colors from yourself, especially if you're painting with lower opacity brushes because you're constantly mixing new colors on the canvas. You can also steal colors from any reference you like, right? So reference is very helpful. 
the more reference, the better. So remember, to steal colors, all you have to do is hold down Option. It will convert whatever tool you're using. We're going to be using the brush tool a lot. It will convert that to the eyedropper tool. And anything open in Photoshop, we can steal colors from, just holding down Option. Here's a past student example. This was his little digital layout sketch. If you're doing portraiture and you want to retain likeness, I definitely recommend, instead of just going for shape painting, uh, trying to break down their facial structure with some sketching. And I can help you individually with this. It's kind of portrait painting techniques. How many eyes across? There are five eyes across the width of the skull. The nose fits between the two eyes. Um, but everyone's face is just slight, has slight variations on that. So basically, you can draw the template on a, on a chicken egg, but some chicken eggs are longer, some are shorter, and the template will kind of shift with that. So he did Jack Black. This was his first sketch. This was what he ended up with in the end. But there's a lot of steps in between. So he kind of blocked out colors and then pretty quickly used things like transform and warp to try to get it to feel better. These are advantages digital painting has that traditional painting doesn't. And then going in with more and more detailed brushes, then adding the glasses on top. With any accessories, things like facial hair, things like glasses, things like piercings, you do them at the end because you don't want them to interfere with your understanding of how the, the facial structure works. And it took about uh, six hours for this student. And then he also did a self-portrait, right? And what's fun is he did this after it's kind of a personal project as a digital honor student. But once you kind of try to match reality, you kind of realize which parts of it you like, which parts of it you don't like. And the fun of painting is that you can push things and you can simplify things and you can, he played with the color, right? He, he didn't go with so many details into each hair. And it's fun when you get to this point. It can be really meticulous when you're still trying to match the highlight on each strand of hair. But it's all part of the learning process. Now, I really, personally, because I'm a big fan of, of traditional painting, digital painting, and lots of different two-dimensional digital techniques, compositing is really helpful to me, like layering up different things uh, as part of your painting process. So what do I mean? Just like if I were painting on a canvas and I do my painting all in acrylic, I then might take sandpaper and like sand the whole thing to mess it up. Or I might take uh, linen strips and glue them onto parts of the painting and then paint over that. Or I might gel medium leaves onto it. You know, ways you can kind of introduce some chaotic elements. That can be done digitally as well. And it's done through compositing. A lot of the time we've done things like texture overlays, color augmentations. We can play with that digitally as well. And it can lead to some interesting solutions. So experimenting can go beyond just how you use your brush, right? So I'm going to use, I was entertaining my boys putting these slides together. So I put a lot of dragon examples together. So here is a, a full digital painting. Obviously, there's no photographs of dragons, right? But there's lots of reference you can use, whether it's different animals or different special effect dragons, video game dragons. But eventually you want to make it your own. So I liked how the, the sketches really evolve. And then with the painting, it evolves further. And notice how the, the foot, the front foot, changes so many times. And digitally, you can always just play with warp and scale and those compositing tools to get it where you want it. Eventually, they just use their back foot as the front foot and then just change the proportions a little bit. And that just works better. Now this one, some of you are going to be more like this. You're so used to line art that you almost want to finish it completely as line art first. But remember, digital painting goes on top of any sketch rather than underneath. So it's at that stat step where they started painting on top of the lines that it becomes a digital painting. Yep. So that I call that converting your digital coloring into digital painting. And you can even save it as separate files and finish them off two different ways, one with outlines and one without. 
Here's another one with really clean line art. So how do you convert it to a digital painting? You delete your clean line art and you start painting over the top of it. Right. And this isn't a bad technique. It's just, it's about the end product you want and knowing the difference between digital painting and digital coloring. All right. So we're going for an end product where there aren't any outlines, right? Everything's kind of painted in shapes. And we can get there in so many different ways. So one inspiring example came from a past student's final presentation. They introduced me to this artist. And it's Max Reed. An 18-year-old freelance illustrator from the UK, probably about 20 now. And what's great is the posts, and they, they post process videos with them, which I like to do with my with my paintings sometimes, to even just to remind myself how I got to the end product. But they're just so direct. Like, I, I admire this. This is kind of the shape painting model. So there's some sketching, but it's just so confidently put in and then just adapted. So this is what I always aspire to demonstrate to you instead of getting really fussy and hung up on something. And sometimes I achieve that, often I don't. But in order to be a really compelling digital painting, it doesn't need to have every detail slaved over. And in some ways, being that you can make it digital and you can always undo and you can always replace can make painting a more burdensome process than it needs to be. So these are an inspiring example of slides. I like how free you can be with color, with edge control, with detail or lack of detail. And most of all, it's the big, bold shapes that matter. Kind of like logo design, right? Kind of like creature design. It's the silhouettes that are gonna, gonna hold the attention. So you don't want like just a muddy puddle as your digital painting. And so if you do an animal, make sure you're doing a silhouette that defines the animal already. If you're doing a person, try to understand like what the big blocks of color are for that person and maybe exaggerate them a little bit. And it's always nice to use good photo reference. So this is from Pulp Fiction, you know, from, from the poster of it, obviously a very professionally lit shot. And that can teach you about things like reflected light and rim lighting and and key lighting, and basically just have fun with it. All right, so what's the demo? How are we gonna do it? So if you go to where you post your digital painting, give you some examples, whether you're trying to replicate from Rembrandt techniques or whether you're trying to give ancient art historical airbrushing to contemporary celebrities, whether you want it to look really energetic or whether you want it to be really closely observed, whether you want it to be really stylized and graphic. All of these are can be digital painting solutions, but it's going to start with some sort of photo reference, right? So I ask you to do an, any animal you like, but from head to toe. We are not going to paint background for our digital paintings. You can if you like, but it, it's, it's just more than we have time for. And then what's great about digital is you can always put a background on it at any time. So you're either gonna do an animal from head to toe just with a blank background, or any kind of person you like from the shoulders up. It can be stylized, it can be a caricature, it can be very representational, for any reason you like, right? So we're gonna get started with choosing our photo reference. So I'm gonna start my instructor example. And I'm going to, and my thinking for doing this is this, this is not something I'm getting paid to do, right? So if you start with a good pun for what you're doing, then even if it turns out terribly, you still have the good pun. It's also fun to play with textures. I don't want to get too hung up on likeness, right? So Waldo is this guy from the children's books. And I think he's Wally in Britain. Like, where's Wally? But anyway, in America, he's Waldo. Because there's so many Waldos you meet around. 
And what's funny is there are Halloween costumes.